On today's episode, SpaceX reveals their new spacesuit, China sends a probe to the dark side of the moon, and NASA makes a liquid mirror telescope. On May 4th, SpaceX revealed something we've all been waiting for. It wasn't a Star Wars collaboration, it's a brand new spacesuit. More specifically, this is an extravehicular activity, or EVA suit, a first for the company. The new EVA suit is developed for use during a spacewalk on the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission, which will serve as the first real-world test of the design and will involve four astronauts being exposed to the vacuum of space at the same time. The new extravehicular activity suit looks very much like the current flight suits used on Crew Dragon missions. It has that same sleek white and black design, same overall helmet shape and 3D printed base, and even has most of the same functionality. This is because the original pressure suit was used as a starting point. SpaceX wanted to carry over already proven features into their EVA design, things like an integrated helmet microphone and speaker, forearm zippers in the gloves to allow for easier use of an astronaut's hand when a full seal isn't needed, and simplified ports for air, power, communications, and rapid inflation umbilical cords. But the basic pressure suit is only meant to handle vacuum in emergencies, so the new suit improves on these features while adding functionality for operating in space. SpaceX wants this suit to be comfortable in both pressurized and unpressurized environments, so they keep the basic helmet but they upgrade it with a new digital heads-up display, which gives the wearer access to their suit's pressure, temperature, and relative humidity levels at a glance, as well as an external copper and indium tin oxide coating to act as a sunshield for the glare in unprotected space. They also improve on the zipper designs by including a spiral pattern zipper at the waist, which allows an astronaut to easily take the suit on and off all on their own. The outer layer material for the EVA suit has been improved to make use of a stretchy flame-resistant material to keep the mobility high while still offering protection. Those simplified umbilical ports have been upgraded as well, with an easy-to-access dial that allows the wearer to better regulate their temperature and oxygen levels while out on a spacewalk. The internals have also been upgraded, with extra redundancies, extra valves, and even redundant helmet seals just to make sure that the new suits can handle the hard vacuum of outer space. Even the boots have had a material upgrade, using the same thermal material found in the Falcon rocket's interstage and the Dragon capsule's trunk compartment, making them suitable for high and low temperatures. Most importantly, however, are the way the joints have been constructed. The original suits have flexible joints, which is great for moving around in a cabin, but if they were ever forced to pressurize the suits in response to an emergency, the astronauts would find it very difficult to move around, as the air pressure suddenly makes those joints too stiff. The new EVA features semi-rigid joints that allow for the suit to remain flexible while in the pressurized cabin, but maintaining some sort of structure to make movement in space less exhausting. These flexure joints are located at the wrists, elbows, waist, and legs. And it's the choice to use hybrid joint structures plus the extra redundancies that really drive home the point that this suit is meant to operate both inside the vehicle and outside, potentially replacing the old flight suits entirely. The briefs and discussions from SpaceX on May 4th made specific mention that the EVA suit is meant to be scalable and easier to produce, meaning that the company is planning on making a bunch of these once they lock in the final design, so that they have equipment that will work for missions from low Earth orbit all the way to the Moon and Mars. But first, it has to pass its first real-world test during Polaris Dawn. Scheduled for launch no sooner than summer 2024, Polaris Dawn is a private mission sponsored by billionaire and commercial astronaut Jared Isaacman. The flight will send him and three other crew members into a unique orbit that reaches as high as 1,400 kilometers above the Earth. The crew will spend five days in their modified Dragon capsule to conduct over 38 science experiments, push the Dragon capsule design to its limits, and of course test the new EVA suit with a two-hour spacewalk at an altitude of 700 kilometers. The plan is to depressurize the entire capsule, which has required some modifications to the Dragon interior that ensure critical components can handle vacuum, and then two of the crew will use a device called a Skywalker to exit the hatch and maneuver around the exterior of the Dragon. Given that this suit has passed the simulations, it's a good bet the real-world test will do just fine, and of course this suit is likely to go through a few iterations as new use cases pop up. We might see more specialized versions for Moon and Mars exploration, 
after this one gets implemented on a wider scale. I want to share a bit of personal news with you here this week. I've finally found an AI assistant that I like. This is Perplexity, the world's first answer engine, and it's my new favorite artificial intelligence powered search tool. Not only can Perplexity answer any question, it also provides a collection of relevant web pages and hyperlinks to sources within the response that show you exactly where the AI got its information from, which is something that no other AI tool can do. If that wasn't enough, Perplexity will also provide you with a collection of images and videos that are relevant to your prompt. It's like replacing three Google searches all in one. Perplexity searches the web in real time and finds the highest quality web pages for your question. Let's try asking it what happened to the SpaceX Starship on 420-2023. Instantly, we get a picture of the explosion, a detailed account of the test flight, and four videos of the launch that we can view right here without even having to open a new tab. It's pretty cool, right? And you can ask Perplexity as many follow-up questions as you want to get all of the specific details. For example, how powerful is the Starship? What fuel does a Raptor engine use? How many times has Falcon 9 landed? Or when's the next Falcon Heavy launch? Check the Perplexity link in the description below to see the answers and try this amazing tool for yourself. I really think you're gonna like it. China took the next step on its path towards the moon on May 3rd as their new 8-ton probe Chang'e 6 launched to space aboard a Long March 5 rocket. The probe should take about five days to reach lunar injection orbit, which means it will be arriving sometime today. From there, it will slowly lower its orbit over the next couple of weeks until, in early June, it will attempt to make a landing on the far side of the lunar south pole in the Aitken Basin. Chang'e 6 will then take the next two Earth days, collecting samples, before blasting off into orbit and heading back to Earth. But it won't be alone. Several European countries are taking advantage of this opportunity and a generous invitation from the Chinese government to send their own experiments to the far side of the moon. France, Italy, and the ESA as a whole are sending along payloads with the probe as well as Pakistan. Of course, nothing from the US made it on board as it's still against the law for NASA to collaborate with any Chinese operations, which is a shame because not only is the far side of the moon rarely studied, China is quickly becoming the experts in the so-called dark hemisphere that always faces away from us. Chang'e 4 landed there in 2019, and now the sixth mission will bring back the first samples we've ever seen from that side of the moon. This mission is meant to gather geological data from the South Pole, a region that almost every country with a moon landing program is aiming for to establish some sort of outpost within the next decade, China included. They were able to discover a great deal about early volcanic activity and the formation of lunar rock when Chang'e 5 brought samples back in 2020, so there's no reason to think they won't find something interesting this time as well. Not to mention, the things they could learn about any potentially useful resources buried there. It's not likely that China will seek to make a base on the far side of the moon, but it's not out of the question. The only real hurdle is that having a base on the side of the moon that never faces Earth would mean needing to set up a communication relay, and China has already been doing that over this past year, so who knows? In fact, the Chinese lunar program is growing very quickly, with Chang'e 3 their first landing on the moon being only 11 years ago in 2013, and now they're sending regular missions there. Despite the American laws against cooperating, China says they intend to share their findings with the world, including NASA, which will likely have to learn about them through the ESA, which is neighborly of them considering they're planning on landing their first astronauts on the lunar surface by 2030 and seem to be on track for doing so, which means NASA better hurry with Artemis if they want to keep up. NASA may have just solved their space telescope problem by using a liquid mirror. One of the biggest issues with getting an orbiting observatory up and running is that they often require huge mirrors to operate. These mirrors are hard to make as they need to be perfect down to the nanometer and are often so large that it's costly just to transport them around the Earth, let alone launch them into space. But a group of NASA scientists have just announced that preliminary testing with a liquid material that has passed microgravity procedures on Earth and on the International Space Station might hold the key to making bigger mirrors safely and cheaply. It's called the Fluidic Telescope, or FLUTE, and the idea is to use ionic liquids to create gigantic, unsegmented mirrors with almost perfectly smooth surfaces. 
Ionic liquids are fluids that contain mostly ions and ionic pairs, like molten table salt, although that's obviously not the fluid NASA is going to be using. These fluids can form surfaces with sub-nanometer smoothness and can be transported and set up in a liquid state. Picture how a space telescope is currently made. A series of delicate mirrors are painstakingly manufactured, and a complex device is designed to handle deploying it safely in space. Then the whole thing is loaded up into a rocket, shot into orbit, and hopefully unfolds properly before calibrations can start. This is how the James Webb Space Telescope was built and deployed, and it uses an array of 18 smaller mirrors to form an aperture that's 6.5 meters wide, one of the largest mirrors we can feasibly send. In fact, this NASA team has calculated that mirror arrays bigger than 10 meters aren't really possible to send cost-wise. But using this new liquid mirror, researchers say that the size is theoretically scale invariant, meaning that its properties won't change based on its size. But for the sake of calculating something realistic to make inside the next 15 to 20 years, they say they have capped their size calculations at a diameter of 50 meters. That's almost 10 times bigger than the current largest telescope we have, and 5 times larger than anything we can afford to build conventionally. The NASA team has already created some preliminary plans and are looking to progress to designing some scaled-down versions to test the setup procedure in space, but should it work as intended, humanity will have access to some of the most flawless mirrors ever conceived at sizes that will make the resolution of the James Webb look like a pre-digital camera.